That is so true. Life is a journey. How many know life is a journey? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has a word for you. Amen. You are going to be blessed today. We are continuing our series. Last week, we started with follow the yellow brick road. Life is a journey, and we just had a great time looking at God's word uh, last week. How many know you need spiritual food for that journey? And we're going to be just blessed today. I've invited my son-in-law, Pastor Jordan, to speak today. Uh, for several reasons. Uh, yesterday was my wife's birthday. Yes. And she's already given me signs like, you know, cut it off. So enough said. And then the day before was my oldest son, Nathan's birthday. And uh, we did get to go see the Cubs play the Marlins. And the Marlins creamed the Cubs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. So we, we've had a good time, a busy time, uh, and uh, I told Nathan, asked me if I was speaking. I said, no, Pastor Jordan's going to be speaking. He said, great. I said, well, son, don't get so excited. <laughs> well, he said, no, Dad, it's just that uh, Pastor Jordan speaks to our generation. And I thought, wow, how important that is. And uh, Pastor Alicia and Pastor Jordan are doing a great job trying to reach the young adults of uh, not only our church, but uh, of this area and our generation. And uh, we are having so many that are participating um, with them in ministry, especially I think they had a record attendance at the axe-throwing contest. I'm like, that's a little too much for me, but uh, it's young adults, and so... Would you welcome Pastor Jordan? I love him as he comes and ministers to us God's Word today on There's a Spiritual Food. Thank you, Pastor Nate. Well, how y'all doing this morning? That's good. About a year ago, I went to Tennessee to visit my mom, and uh, Alicia and me and the family were staying there for a few weeks or so. And while I was there, I went to church with her. And I went to church. Their worship leader said that he was a CrossFit instructor. How many of y'all know what CrossFit is? These people are real. They're out there. So I I was like, you know what? You seem pretty cool. If you're an instructor, I'll go to the class. (laughs) Oh, I went. It happened. So I I went to this class. And he starts it off, and he starts describing what we're going to do. And so I end up running like two miles, and I do all these burpees and all this stuff. And we get done with that part of it. And he's like, what an awesome warm-up, guys. (laughs) Oh, no. Uh Uh-uh. But I really, really wanted to push through the class, and they had some people that were like, they were like doing like an easier version of me, uh, of it, but that's just not me. I was like, you know what, I'm going to do what y'all are doing. I'm here, it's happening. And about midway through the class, I was on the ground, and I was like doing these sit-up things, and I don't know if you've ever gotten overheated or you ran too much. How many of y'all like to run? Huh? Yeah, so-so, work out? Well, y'all can, y'all can leave, right? <laughs> Are you, as a matter of fact, y'all can run. I don't just, I, I started trying, I got up to go, and I immediately got sick. Made it to the bathroom, and I just threw up everywhere, all over the bathroom. And then whenever I come out of the bathroom, the CrossFit instructor is sitting here looking at me like this. Like he was excited about this. And he's like, did you get sick? Yeah, yeah, I got sick. He's like, awesome. It happens to everybody. And it was in that moment that I was like, you know what? I don't think this is for me. <laughs> and, right? Uh, so uh, really, though, uh, how many of y'all work out or try to eat healthy? So-so, about half. Um, my hands, I'm, yeah, I'm like lukewarm in that capacity. It's, it's seasonal, or, I suppose. But uh, those of you that do uh, like working out and eating healthy, why do you do it? 
to feel good? It's a good answer. Lose weight, live longer, be healthy for your kids. Yeah, these are all these are all the right answers. That's it. I it yeah. To keep yourself healthy and to press on. So that you can keep on, so that you can live longer and that you can do more, that you can, you know, uh, yeah, do more with your body. You don't run out of energy as fast. I was thinking about this this week and how that all the time we actually, I'm more and more I'm hearing it preached about our physical health, the things that we should do and how we're supposed to live our day-to-day lives, but less and less about our spiritual health. The fact that the same way that you have to train your body and that you have to uh, eat right and that you need to treat your body as a temple as you're pursuing the things of the Lord, the same way that you're taught that, that spiritually it's so important to give your soul nourishment to give your spirit nourishment. That we have things that the Lord calls us to do and places that we're supposed to go and, and things that he's gonna ask us to step out into that we're not gonna be able to do it unless we're nourished the way that we're supposed to be nourished. What I've learned is that you go through some dry seasons. You go through some terrible things or, or you go through just, see, you ever had a season that you just, you just, tired and you don't know why like you just kind of get beat down you're like it doesn't you know you had this this gusto this this want to do certain things and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're like I am exhausted I've been running around I've been doing this and it doesn't seem to make as much sense in those moments oh that's just me my bad my bad guys no whenever you are uh pushing yourself you will see that there are seasons that you seem weaker in your mind. And the thing that I've learned is that you can be physically weak or you can be spiritually weakened. You can be tired in the spirit or you can be tired and drained physically. But if I am physically tired and drained, but spiritually full, if I'm spiritually fed, if I am, I will always find a way to push through. But the vice versa of that, if I am physically on point, but spiritually drained, I'm going to end up falling away from the things that the Lord has for me. I'm going to say that again. Say that again. If you are spiritually drained, you will not press on and finish what you're supposed to. If you're physically drained, but spiritually fooled, uh, fooled, that you will be able to mount up on wings like eagles. That's what Paul says. He says that we can do all things that that, through Christ that strengthens us. That is not talking about like a football play or, or some kind of incredible feat. It's talking about the sufferings that he was enduring in his life. He said, I've learned to be content in every situation and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. To have energy, to be healthy, it's very important. Especially in our go, go, go world, it seems like it's so easy to be filled up with everything without your spirit actually being full. I'm going to go through a few scriptures that reference uh, food for your uh, spirit. The first is John 26 through 27. It says, Jesus answered to them, it said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because of the signs that you saw, because you ate, the, ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food, somebody say food, which perishes, but for food which endures the everlasting life. Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God with all these, uh, that led you all these ways these 40 years to humble you and to test you, that sounds like they're tired, right? When you get humbled and tested. Oh, yeah. To know what was in your heart, whether you keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might know what was in your heart and make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Not by bread alone, 
That's a contrast between the spiritual and the physical. He said, I put you through test physically so that we could see what's in your heart spiritually. He references it again in Matthew 4, the man might not live by bread alone, but every mouth that, word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And then Isaiah 55 is, verses 2 and 3. It says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul itself, uh, soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and you shall live. What I found is that a majority of believers that fall by the wayside do so because they're not spiritually fed. They're not spiritually feeding themselves. You ever said, man, they were really going strong. What happened? I know with social media and Facebook, I say that all the time. I was like, I was in ministry with him. He was preaching. Like, I saw what the things that he was going to do. I remember prophesying over him. What happened? It's because a lot of times people hit that a one season in their life, one season where they are no, don't have the spiritual endurance to get through it because they were not fed in the way that the Lord calls us to be fed. Our base scripture today is going to be John 4. And we're going to go through how you get this spiritual nourishment. And so uh, let me just set this up for you. They are in Judea, they being the disciples and Jesus. And the disciples start baptizing people in the name of Jesus. And the Pharisees start paying attention to this. And the Pharisees are like, he has more disciples. He's, he's baptizing more people than what John the Baptist did. And Jesus hears about this, and he starts separating himself from the bunch. And it says that he's going to Galilee. So on his way to Galilee, it says in verse 6 that he stops off in Samaria at a place called Sychar at Jacob's well. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired, tired as he was from the journey, which that'll encourage you, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. You know what's crazy is it says how, I mean, so Jesus nonstop, this three years of his ministry, it's go, go, go nonstop. And I actually like that it references that he's tired. But what I like more is the fact that he comes and he just comes to get water at uh, Samaria here. And it says later in, I think, verse 40 that he stay, ends up staying for two days once they figure out that he's the Messiah. And he, he teaches them and talks to them and loves on these people that no Jew wanted to even associate with. So he's sitting here at the well, and then boom. Jesus asks a Samaritan woman for water. And she's, she's thrown off because they don't associate together. They don't talk to each other. He's like, why would you ask me for water? And Jesus is like, well, because I'm thirsty, right? And he, and he ends up uh, telling her that he was, that he had living water. And she says, now she kind of calls Jesus out here. She's like, living water? She's like, this well is very deep. You don't have a rope. You don't have a bucket. And uh are you saying that you're even greater than my ancestors, Jacob? And Jesus is like, if you only knew, right? O-M me. Like, I got this. He says, yes, I am. He says, I have a living water that's, uh, that will produce a spring of life inside of you that will well up from the inside that you, will never, that you will never, hallelujah, that you will never thirst again. She's like, give me. And then he starts getting all up in her business about stuff, right? She starts talking about her husband, her five husbands, and the person that she's with right now, we'll just call him her fiance. And the, you know. 
They started um, uh, talking about the difference between the Samaritans and the Jews in the worship place. And Jesus uh, comes and he cut. You know, a lot of times when people start arguing about semantics, especially, I mean, with politics and, and, and when you're uh, biblical, uh, biblically, when people are arguing about things, just a little bit of, it just takes a little bit of truth to cut through it. And that's what Jesus always did. He would cut through all the nonsense with truth and love. In verse 22, he says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. Somebody say spirit. And in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So then he goes and tells her that the, she, he's the Messiah, and then the disciples come over, and they're like, oh, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. Gross. Why is he doing that? It actually says that they wanted to act. It doesn't, I'll, I'll just read it for you. Verse 22, it says, Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one, with the woman, and no one asked, What do you want or why are you talking with her? That's important to me. It says they thought it, but nobody asked it. They were like, you know what? Jesus is just doing him. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way for them. John verses uh, 4, it's 31 through 38 is what I'm going to be going through now. It says, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have a food that you know nothing about. This really jumped out to me whenever I was reading the scripture yesterday. There's so much of our life that doesn't make sense. There's so much of my life that does not make sense to people around me, to people from the outside looking in. Why would you do things that way? Why, why would you keep pushing on in that direction? And I know that there's some of you that have uh, things like this in your life that, you know, any time that you start to get tired, people start to creep in and start to plant seeds that probably shouldn't be there. Yeah. You get questions like, let's just take something like going to church, right? Why would you do that? We're in a go, go, go society. Like that's supposed to be your day of rest. You ever had that, heard that logic? Yeah, I got to wake up early. Like trying to, you need to be able to sleep in, be able to rest. You've got work tomorrow. Your kids kept you up all night. I mean, why would you take the time? Why would you take that couple hours to go up there? Why would, why would you want to be a part of something like that? The answer is because I've got food that you know nothing about. I do get wore down just like everybody else, but I get to mount up like nobody else does because I've got a food that you know nothing about. Can I take that a step further? You get to tell even more when you start talking about serving. When you start talking about serving in the church, it makes even less sense then. Because it's not just the Sunday morning. It's not just that checkbox. Usually it's getting something done or accomplished. Or it's signing your soul away, basically. Like you're, you're coming a part of a team. You're becoming a part of the children's ministry team, the youth team, the outreach team, the women's ministry. You are going to join up with them. And it's not just some set hours like your job or coming in on Sunday. It's actually giving time that you don't know when. Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. And the answer is because I've got a food that you know nothing about. Can I brag on Mr. Mike for a second here? Why would you come, why would you come and start laying floors and shaving down door frames for hours and hours and hours on your time off? Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Are you getting paid to do it? No. Well, they, they got the supplies for you, right? No. Pastor Nate, why would you come in on Sundays at 5 a.m. 
and start lining up chairs, vacuuming floors, making sure that the sound is ready to go. Why, why would you answer calls at three in the morning? All of those are very early tasks, which I don't think the Lord's even up then. <laughs> Going to hospital visits for people that you don't even know. Why would you do something like that? You, you got to be busy. Why would you devote so many years to planning a church and seeing it grow? Because he's got a food that they know nothing about. It doesn't make any sense to people who don't know what they're connected to. There's a spiritual food. All right, I'm going to take it another step further. Let's talk about giving. Why in the world would we give 10% of our income to a church? Why would you ever give beyond that to a church? Don't you see what's happening? There's record numbers in the stock market. Cryptocurrencies are going, you'd be better off just going and investing that money. Well, the truth is, is that you are, but you're investing into something that they know nothing about. You're investing into souls. You're investing into a harvest. You will. Most of what we do doesn't make sense to those around us, and that is okay. As long as you are spiritually connected and knowing that you are spiritually filled through the Lord, and I'm about to, I'm, I'm about to take this another step further and explain how to get there. But I know, I, felt, I just felt like I was supposed to do that this morning, that there's some of you that you need to be able to have that answer, that rebuttal. That whenever people start attacking you and you, you physically can't take it, you mentally can't take it, and you feel, you're starting to feel a little spiritually drained, you're going to be able to say, you know what, you have no idea because you don't know who he is to me. A food that you know nothing about. So here we are. In verse 33, it says, Then the disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? Which sounds just like the disciples. It's like, John, I thought you had this. Peter's like, No, it was Mark. Like, somebody should have thought this through. The man ran over here from Judea. And then verse 34, Jesus clarifies. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it is still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvest a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. He said, look at this food in front of me. You know what one of the biggest food elements for your spirit is? Winning souls for the kingdom. It's doing the work of the Lord. And you know why that is? I've been thinking and praying long and hard about this. And I think it's because most of the times when that happens, it's really awkward and weird at first. You ever had, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about? It's like you're sitting there at the gas station. You're like, I think I should pray for that person, which is weird. How are they going to receive that? What's going to happen? Or I, I think I should get their food. You ever had that one? Yeah. I'm like, I was sketchy about coming here in the first place. <laughs> but honestly, whenever you start doing the will of the Lord, he stretches you in ways that you, have, that you wouldn't stretch yourself. Those of you who work out, or anybody who's like really into working out, 
like all the time or consistently? I would say, I would ask you, you know, what was the thing that made you keep coming back? Results. That's it. You've been on point. You've been getting all these today. <laughs> Results. That's a thing that a lot of people don't grab a hold of. We overcome by the power of blood and the word of our testimony. You know what the biggest testimonies are? Is you stepping out in faith and seeing the Lord show up. You stepping out and doing things he's asked you to and watching him just bring the rest. And you get to say, I didn't even really do that much. We saw that with the youth and children's ministry in Chicago. Everyone's like what, coming and asking us. We're like, what are y'all doing? I'd be like, nothing. <laughs> Seriously, I don't, I have no idea. Like we just step out, the Lord does it and uh, changes lives. The reason this is food for you is because you were never meant to sit, be sitting idly by in your faith. You were meant to step out over and over again, and you were meant to win souls for the kingdom. And you can grab a hold of those things whenever you get attacked and when stuff starts happening and when life doesn't quite look like you want it to look, you can easily look back and you say, no, no, look what the Lord did. And that's something, that's the food that'll push you on further and further. He said, I have a food that you have nothing about, and that is doing the work of my Father who sent me. I went way past everything. <laughs> praying for your neighbor, praying for a stranger. Seeing your faith in action is actually, it's not, and I, I did say this, but I'm going to say it again. It's not just something that you want to happen. It's something that you need to happen. It's a necessary part of this journey. Now, here's the important part to this. That's not where he stopped. In verse 34, he says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. That's my food. My perseverance, the thing that keeps me nourished and pushing on is finishing the work. This jumped off the page at me whenever I read this. I wrote that first part and I was like, I'm good. Right? Like that, that seems like it's going to be a great sermon. But then whenever I read it again, I saw and to finish the work. And I realized that that's the whole thing. A lot of times what we do as Christians is we get really excited about something for a season. And then we get tired of doing that thing. Or we get wore out because it's taken more out of us than what we thought it was going to take. Or maybe we just don't have the same vision. We say, you know, the, the vision's just not there. We don't have the, you know, maybe I was just mistaken or I was just excited in that moment. Did the Lord really tell me to do that? Oh, some of y'all getting real quiet. <laughs> Seriously, as we start to step out, it's really fun and awesome, but if it slows down for a minute or we get tired or if we get beat down for a minute, a lot of times we say, you know what? I don't think I'm going to use that gift in that way anymore. That we're not going to keep pushing in that direction anymore because it, I'm not really seeing the fruit that I wanted to see from it. And what you're really saying is I'm not seeing the fruit from me that I really wanted to see because I'm not trusting the Lord more. It's to finish. My food is to do the will and to finish the work that he sent me, that, of the one who sent me. You have, to per, you have to make up in your mind, in your heart of hearts, that if you're going to step out and do it, 
if you already have, if you've already said, you know what, I'm going to use that gift for God. I'm going to be involved in that area of ministry because that's where the Lord wants me. I'm going to start that outreach because the Lord's laid it on my heart. And anytime I hear about that group of people, it breaks my heart. That I have a talent that the Lord has blessed me with. And but like we talked about last week, we're starting to bury it because we're scared that we're not going to be enough. And the truth is, is that you never were enough. It was the Lord that did it for you. You're never going to be strong enough to overcome that. You're never going to be strong enough to do the thing. You're never going to be brave enough or smart enough, talented enough to do the things that the Lord has for you. And that's the beautiful part of this whole thing is that it's not by works. It's by grace and the power and the blood that we're able to do the things the Lord has called for us. And it's on us for us to have, for us to grow our faith and to do those things so that we have spiritual nourishment that other people know nothing about. To not just do the works, but to finish. You have to be obedient and steadfast. And Verses 37 and 38 of John 4. And if um, you could come up and uh, play, I'm going to be getting ready to close, maybe. <laughs> Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. And it's one of my go-to scriptures because it's so easy. Like I said, most Christians step away because of one season, one moment in their lives where they tell themselves a lie or they hear a lie and they choose not to fight it because they're spiritually drained. And so whenever I get attacked, that's one of my go-tos to not grow weary in doing good. My favorite part of this whole scripture are verses... 37 and 38. It says, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the work, the hard, others have done not just the work, the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. We're about to reap a harvest. Alicia stole that line about Pastor Nate this morning in the offering from my message. Just want to put that out there. I shared it with her last night. Uh huh. Okay. Mm. I'll tell you. But on Wednesday at service, Pastor Nate did mention that this is one of the most unchurched counties in the entire US, number one on the list, as far as people that have never gone to church once in their life. I grew up in the Bible Belt and everybody been to church, but it's really hard to find a Christian. I'm serious. As long as you, were, you hit that box on Sunday, you were good to go, rather than actually pursuing the things that the Lord has for you, it's another thing altogether. And I was sitting in chair over here when Pastor Nate said that, and I almost jumped out of my chair. I got so excited. Because the thing that I know is that someone who thinks that they know it all and have heard it all will completely ignore you. They're like, yeah, my grandmother used to say that stuff about Jesus, right? But the ones that don't actually know or have never met or have been encountered with the name of Jesus, there's a fire that can take place that you have never seen before in your life. There's a, something that turns inside of them. It's a switch. There's scales that go off of eyes. This scripture says that as we step out and that we, uh, we're going to reap a harvest, and it's not going to be because of our, someone else sowed the seeds already. 
They did the hard work. And now we're going to both get the benefit of that. And I want to receive that in my life. And I want to receive that for this church. The fact that there is a harvest. It's the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. That I think that there is an opportunity, especially in this season, for us to win more souls than we've ever seen. I think it is time. Romans 10, 15 says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hallelujah and hearing by the word of God. And then Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And the last one, I wasn't sure if I was going to put this one in here, but 1 Thessalonians 2, 5 says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God, who test our hearts. A lot of times when we're talking about doing outreach or or, or touching lives and and going after souls in your community, a lot of times I feel like we overcomplicate it so much. We try to make it too hard. We'll have six meetings talking about, telling about Jesus instead of just going and telling them about Jesus. I encounter people every single day that need to hear from the Lord, that the Lord's already calling on their heart. And I'll find myself, I'm not perfect in this. I'll find myself sometimes and I'm like, oh, I don't know how, like, I'm not too sure. You know, the answer is Jesus, right? But how, how am I going to get there from what they just said? How's this going to turn? I know, I barely know this person. I don't know this person at all. Actually, I find it so much easier when I don't know the person at all rather than the people I know really well because I think I've said it to them all about a thousand times. I've got a whole bunch of friends that don't follow the Lord and I, you know, I find every opportunity that I can, but sometimes it's like weird. It's like, they're like, oh, here he goes again, right? You go and talk about this. It is sometimes weird, sometimes difficult, and it takes a lot of faith for you to step out in your everyday life. And as you step out, you're gonna have to continue to press on and push on, and it's not always gonna look the way that you want, but I promise you that the Lord always does show up and he grows you in each one of those seasons. You just gotta make it up in your mind that that's what you're wanting to do that you're wanting everything that the Lord has for you, that you want to nourish your spirit in a way that no matter what's happening around you, you're going to be able to stand steadfast. If I um, we just uh, bow our heads really quickly. There's many of us that We're encouraged today by the message. I, I preached my, to myself today. I encouraged myself. But there's a, a few groups of people I want to talk to at, right before we close out. And the first is you would say, you know what? This is all sounds great. It, it looks great. But the truth is, is that I'm not too sure about this purpose that you're talking about. It sounds like you've been talking about, uh, you know, doing things for something beyond me, but I'm not too sure what that looks like. You say, you know what? I don't know, but I do want to know more about a a perfect love that casts out all fear, that I can throw my burdens on the Lord. This is you. Would you just slip up your hands really quickly? Thank you. Thank you. The second group of people I want to talk to this morning is you've answered the call, 
but you didn't make it up your mind to the finish what you were called into. That you gave something for a season and then you got wore out given that and you're not too sure if you want to or you got, my favorite is that you got hurt when you were in ministry and you were stepping out and you're not too sure if you want to continue on doing that sort of thing. But you'd say, you know what? The Holy Spirit's been putting it on my heart for a while now and you brought it up again today. And I want to say, you know what? I don't want to have any fear. Because perfect love does cast out all fear, and that fear is the opposite of love. And you say, I I did it for a moment, and I'm choosing that I'm going to start using those gifts. I'm going to pursue that call once again. This is you. Would you mind just slipping up your hands really quick? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's a third group I want to talk to as well. Yes, it's a three-fold altar call. You'd say, I want to answer that last call, which is to reap a harvest. I want to step out more. I want to see souls come to the kingdom more. That I'm going to be purposeful in my day-to-day actions, my day-to-day life. I'm going to say, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I don't care what they saw me do. I don't care what it seems like. I'm going to reach people for the Lord, because like Alicia said, this is an eternal thing and death is so final. They're not gonna stand by and watch those around us, especially in the county that we're in, watch them go to hell. If you'd like to stand and answer a call to go for a harvest, I'd like you just to stand to your feet really quickly. Thank you. Lord, I pray for each group. We had hands raised in each section with each thing that we called. Those that are choosing to follow after you like they never have before, that are gonna choose your love and know that you did it all at Calvary. I pray that they will not leave here the same, that they are washed in that blood, that they're gonna be a new creature. For those that are choosing to give their gifts back to the Lord, that are choosing to pursue something that they walked away from or that got hurt, I speak healing, I speak fresh life, I speak a fresh anointing over them in this moment. And for all of those that stood to go after souls, this is a big deal, guys. I pray that you ingrain this into your mind that you're not gonna leave here the same, that there's gonna be a fresh fire in your belly, that you're not gonna, you're gonna see opportunities more and more because there's gonna be a revelation of who's sitting next to you. There's gonna be a revelation that you're not the only one doing it either. If you look around right now, most of the room is standing. It's because people wanna step out, but when you go out there, you usually go out there by yourself which can seem hard, but just know that it's nourishment for your soul and it's what's gonna continue. It's not just nourishment. It's not just something that you want to do. It's something that you have to do in your life to see your faith grow. So I pray for a fresh fire and a fresh anointing and that your eyes will be open, that you'll see the opportunities and no matter what the circumstances, you're not gonna back down because it's the Lord calling you to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Uh, uh, do you want to come up and close? or can... Didn't you enjoy that? Weren't you blessed? Thank you, Pastor Jordan. We are going to dismiss and have a closing word of prayer. I, I said something a few weeks ago, and I didn't realize uh, what an impact it had on many of you because you shared with me and you started using that one word in that phrase. And I just want to mention it again because it does have an impact. The most dangerous word in the English language is someday. And as Pastor Jordan was sharing, that's really what Jesus was saying. He was saying, isn't there a phrase that you use that says there's four months until harvest? 
And then he says these words that just come alive. He says, open your eyes. Open your eyes. It's not four months. Look at the harvest. It's ripe. It's ready right now. And it, it just took me to a place where I, I, I want to ask you this question that we're going to close in prayer. Think of the person you love the very most. You love, I mean, your heart aches when you think of their name because you love them so much. Do they know the Lord? If something were to happen to them, are they ready to stand before God this morning? Could it be that God is saying to you today, not someday, not four months until harvest, open your eyes. Today is a day of opportunity. In fact, that's what the Bible says. Make the most of every opportunity. God wants to use you to be his mouthpiece, to speak into their lives that God loves them. You can say that to friends or family. God loves you. And another way to reach out to people is to pray for them. Because here's what I know about human nature. Everybody complains. Oh, I've got this, this side ache or, you know, I, my car's not running like it should. Uh, uh, I've got, you know, my cousin is, you know, I hear it all the time. And you've heard, you've heard me say this. Let me pray with you about that right now. What does that do that opens a door for you? And this is being said because some of you are going to have the opportunity to pray with a loved one or friend. It's going to open a door for you to share the love of Christ in their lives. Now, today is the day of salvation. Hear what I'm saying, church? Let's pray. And I want you to be God's missionaries to, to your family, to your friends, where you work, to the world, right here in Boca Raton, that you would be a missionary. And that's what it means. My food is to finish His work, to reach my friends, my family, those with the gospel. God loves them unconditionally unconditionally. It doesn't matter what they've done in the past, what they're like, or their personality. God loves every single one. And you're in their life for a purpose to bring about a change. To be God's mouthpiece. To say, I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, I just pray for everyone here today. Lord, as we leave this place, this sanctuary, and Lord, we thank you for your presence that we have felt. Father, I am commissioning each and every person to be a missionary today, to be your mouthpiece, to speak, thus saith the Lord, to, to proclaim the gospel, Father, that you love us unconditionally, and that, Father, their lives can, can make a change and you can bring purpose and joy into their lives. Father, we thank you for this message and the words that we've heard. Lord, we ask that you would continue to anoint it. Lord, for this week may be food to us that we may feel your calling and sense, Lord, your direction. Lord, to make a difference in people's lives by sharing your love. Father, we give you praise for it in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We have a tradition here. You can't leave until you hug at least 10 people. So grab someone, shake their hand, hug them, let them know they're important to the kingdom of God. Go in the power of our Lord and Savior. May his grace be with you. Amen.